Well, now that the fall spring is gone, winter's back. I have a couple of extra bonus scriptures this morning I thought I'd share with you. It's really encouraging to read these, and um, I'm always touched by them. It's 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed us to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. So encouraging to know that Lord has given us the Holy Spirit so that we can understand the things of God and God uses his word to reveal to us the truth and Jesus said you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So we're reading from the book of Psalms today and Psalm 102 verses 18 to 28. So that's Psalm 102 And so, starting in verse 18, this will be written for the generation to come, that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. For he looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven, the Lord viewed the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to release those appointed to death to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. When the peoples are gathered together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord. He weakened my strength in the way. He shortened my days. I said, oh my God, do not take away. Do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. Of old, you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end the children of your servants will continue and their descendants will be established before you. Thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you, musicians. Good morning. And welcome to each of you. Good to be together this morning. Uh, this being the first Sunday of the month, we are again deviating from our study of Matthew to look at the attributes of God, which we're going to do each first Sunday of each month. Today we're looking at the attribute of God being um, immutable, unchangeable, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So let's just bow our hearts in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for all that you have, have done on our behalf and all of your works declare your glory, your greatness, your holiness. You are absolutely unlike any other being or thing in existence. Lord God, you are truly an awesome God. And as we look at your attribute of being immutable this morning, I pray that you would uh, cause our hearts to rejoice, that you would bring great confidence and peace to us in knowing that we have such uh, a rock to stand upon, to build upon, and Father, I pray for your enabling. I ask that you would speak 
through your word to our hearts that you would bring about the change that we need in our lives by your word and by your spirit. And I just yield myself to you and entrust you to use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God is unchangeable. But most people don't like change. Uh, most people. Some people seem to thrive on it, but most people don't like change. In fact, most people fear change and fear the unknown. But there is a, a great sense of security that comes with stability. When things are the same, uh, predictable, uh, it brings security. Children who grow up in a stable home have a much greater level of confidence and security than those who grow up in uh, an unstable, unpredictable environment. Because we fear the unknown or the unfamiliar, we tend to uh, stick with that which is familiar and avoid the risk of un uncertainty and the risk of change. Uh, you find a, a job you like and you stick with it. Uh, maybe you don't like it, but uh, you fear the unknown more than the known. Uh, a comfortable home, you like to stay. A safe, friendly neighborhood, a favorite meal. Uh, you like to stick with those things. We tend to feel insecure with change, especially when uh, the cause of change is out of our control and we can't regulate it. We value things that don't change very easily, like gold. Uh, it's a stable commodity. We value diamonds because they're nearly indestructible. But look at our world today, all the fear that is being created over the idea of climate, climate what? Climate change. Uh, economic changes, uh, the Great Reset, the promise everything's going to change. It's all going to be reset, starting over. Uh, So-called gender changes, constantly changing moral values, changing laws. The bigger the change, the greater the insecurity. And one of the most unsettling characteristics of our world today is that everything is rapidly changing and very little is the same anymore. And this produces fear, insecurity, dread, and uh, big changes, big fears. Big changes like leaving your friends and moving to a new unknown city. Some of you had that experience starting in a new school where you knew nobody. Or the breakup of a home through divorce. That's big change. Or making a career change uh, produces a high level of stress and insecurity. And perhaps the biggest change that you will ever face in your life is the change brought about by death. And few things produce as great a fear as death because it is a big change. Everything changes, and you can't see what is on the other side. But this morning, we are going to look at the greatest source of security, confidence, and stability known to man. We're going to look at the only thing in existence that is absolute, secure, unshakable, and eternally trustworthy. We're going to look at our God who never changes. Did you know that our God is immutable? Talked about that a few minutes ago. Immutable. It's probably not a word that you use every day, um, but it's one of the attributes of God, and it distinguishes him from every other being. The word immutable is the opposite of the word uh, mutate or mutable. Uh, which is a Latin word meaning subject to change, from which we get a mutation, for example, meaning a change in form, change in nature, a change in substance. But God cannot mutate. He is immutable. 
And so immutable means unchangeable. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, it is impossible for God to mutate. It is impossible for God to change from the way he is. And that's a good thing because he is perfect. And he cannot change from being perfect. To change from perfection would be imperfection. If he were to, to get better, that would mean, well, he wasn't perfect. He is perfect. You can't improve on that. Um, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, and uh, for many of you, you received a handout and you came in, just because I'm going through some brief scriptures and not giving you a lot of time to look them up, so I thought I would help you by printing it. But Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, God said, For I am the Lord, I do not change. And in James chapter 1, verse 17, With God there is no variation or shadow due to change. Another translation, God does not change like shifting shadows. He doesn't change. Hebrews 13, verse 8, Quoted it already. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. By the end of, of this study this morning, I trust that that expression is going to mean a lot more to you than maybe it has before. The same yesterday, today, forever. The way God was yesterday, or a hundred years ago, or 5,000 years ago is the way God is still today, exactly the same. He hasn't changed, and he will always be forever. Now, there's a, a Greek concept of unchangeable that uh, refers to something that is static, unmovable, like a rock. Um, it doesn't change, but it doesn't move. It doesn't do anything. It's just there. Well, that's not the way our God is. He, he's alive. He's fluid. He moves, but... There's an aspect, an element of them that is unchanged. Only God is immutable. Everything else in existence can change, and everything else does eventually in time change. Only God is perfect, and therefore God is always the same. Even the angels are subject to change. The Bible tells us that Satan and all of the demons were at one time beautiful, pure, holy angels. But they changed. They rebelled against God. They were corrupted and therefore became the wicked, ugly creatures that we know them to be. Only God is perfect and flawless in every way and will never change. Unlike God, people are always changing. Uh, can anyone here say, I've never changed? <laughs> I, I've always been the same? Well, we all began this world as a small embryo, grew into a chubby, cuddly little baby, then a, a toddler, sometimes not so cute, uh, a child, an adolescent, then an adult. We are constantly changing constantly changing. Uh, we are changing our views, changing our attitudes, changing our understanding and our concept of the world around us. We're growing. Unlike God, we change constantly. Isn't it sobering to pull out pictures of ourselves? Recently, uh, we had to pull together some old family pictures for, for my dad's funeral. We were putting together a slide presentation and uh, what should have taken us a few minutes took hours because we got sidetracked with, wow, <laughs> all the changes. Um, picturing yourself 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, and see how you've changed. And not only you, but the world around you and everybody else is changing. Uh, we change physically, change intellectually emotionally, spiritually. Our interests change. Things that once were hobbies, you've cast aside because you've changed. Interests changed. Abilities develop. 
things you couldn't do before you can now do, and things you could do before maybe you now can't. Our ideas and convictions mature. Our understanding changes. We change our mind. We change our hair color. Uh, we lose hair. We gain hair. We change our loyalties. Everything about us changes. There is nothing about us that stays the same. In many ways, because we are imperfect, falling beings, um, born in sin, we thank God that we can change. Thank God that we are not forever set in that mold that we were born into. Thank God that we can be changed by his grace. It's unbiblical for you to ever point at a flaw in your character or some bad habit in your life and say, I can't help being like this. It's just the way I am. I can't change. No, only God can say that. Only God is unchangeable. When things are going well, it's dangerous to assume that this is the way you will always be. Pride comes before a fall. Um, things change. And so only God is unchangeable. You can be changed. Those flaws, those weaknesses, those imperfections about you, if you let God work on your life, he is in the business of changing us, little by little, day by day, conforming us to the likeness of his character. One of the greatest sources of pain, however, in life, greatest source of heartache, is when people change for the worse. The loving, kind, considerate couple who fell in love with each other got married, can change and become cruel and abusive enemies. The well-dispositioned child that once brought joy to your heart can change to become a rebel or a fool and bring you great shame and heartache. The close friend with whom you once confided and shared uh, your deepest, most intimate secrets and joys can change and no longer have anything to do with you or even turn against you. But God will never change. His attitude towards you will not change. There is no chance that one day God will go bad. I can remember there's a time in my life when I used to fear that. Well, God, you're, you're nice today, but what if you become like the fallen angels. Can I trust you? The nature of his, the attributes of his nature is that he cannot change. It is impossible for God to change. And that should bring tremendous security to our hearts. There is no chance, not the slightest chance, that one day God will become cruel and evil like the demons did. The way that God was when Adam and Eve knew him is exactly the way he is today. He has not changed one iota. How foolish of us to seek security and stability in people or things that are constantly changing rather than looking to the Lord for security. People will often let you down. People will disappoint you. But God will never fail you. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, the Bible says that God himself has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake, nor let you down, nor relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. He can say that because he does not change. Praise the Lord. He never changes. Praise the Lord. He is immutable. 
How many of you have ever wondered, uh, where, where did God come from? <laughs> Who made God? When did, when did God begin? Well, there never was a time when he did not exist. Um, one of his attributes being eternal. He is infinite in, in time. He, he always existed. There's no beginning to God. There will not come a, an end to God. He will always be. He never developed. He never grew up. He never started as something less and became something greater. He never improved. He has always been perfect. He is perfect eternally, without beginning, without end. We are born in time. Everything we live amongst is time related. We cannot conceive of something that is outside of time, something that had no beginning. We just think, Everything began somewhere, but God never began. He has always been. Um, all that he is today, he has always been and forever will be. In Exodus chapter 3, uh, God was sending Moses to Egypt to deliver the people of Israel from, from Egypt. And um, Moses had some questions about God. In verse 13, Exodus chapter 3, Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I, what shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent, you to, sent me to you. Notice, I am who I am is all capitalized. It's capitalized in the Bible. This is God's name. It is uh, his highest name. Uh, it is also... Yahweh, which is I am. Uh, his name, I am, means the self-existent one. I am who I am. This is one of God's attributes or characteristics. He is self-existent. That means that God is, um, I am, he doesn't say I was, I am, I will be, but I always am. I am always in that present tense. Um, he's not made up of anything else. That's another fascinating characteristic of God. And in, in these studies of the attributes of God, if it doesn't give you a, a headache, you're not thinking hard enough about it. But God is not made up of anything else. Um, but himself. He has no lesser substance as part of his being. Being I am means nobody made God. He simply is because he always has been. Uh, he had no beginning and he has no end. He is eternal. He's always been. God doesn't need anything or anyone he is totally self-sufficient. He needs nothing. I am. There's a, a saying, um, the little girls are made of sugar and spice and everything nice. And boys are made of snakes and snails and puppy dog tails. <laughs> What's God made of? <laughs> The fact that God is self-existent, that he is the I am, means that God is not composed. He was not formed. He was not created. He can't be broken down into his bare elements or dissected into parts. He is spirit, and yet he is a person. There is no one like our God. When the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 that the Lord our God is one Lord, 
It does not simply mean that there is only one God, though it certainly includes that in its meaning. But Deuteronomy 6.4 is also saying that God is one in essence. He is not a composite being. He is not divided within mind, heart, or, or self in any way. There, there are no parts to God. God is not made of anything but God. You cannot describe God as he's a little of this and a little of that. There is no molecular structure or DNA or genetic makeup or biological composition for God. You cannot break God down into anything less or smaller than the fullness of God. Remember when we looked at the attribute of God being everywhere? It means that the fullness of God's essence is everywhere. Um, his head's not a little closer to some and his feet a little closer to others. Uh, no, everywhere that God is, he is all there. Unlike you. Your, your feet are down on the floor. I can't see most of your feet. Your heads are up in the air. I can see most of your heads. Your butts are on the seat. But you are not equally present everywhere. Uh, parts of you are up here, parts of you down there. Uh, you're spread out in the space that you occupy. But with God, there are no places where God is less present or less conscious. I'm a little more conscious of what's happening here than back here, but that's not so with God. Where God is partly there? No, he's fully there. God is fully present everywhere. He does not have parts in heaven and parts on earth and, and parts on Mars and, and so on. He, is, he alone is one. In contrast, we were formed and assembled, and you can take us apart. But God is not composed of anything. He is self-existent. Now, we use the fact that creation has been composed and assembled as evidence that it didn't just happen, but that there was a creator that put all these parts together in an amazing way. To be composed or made up of parts means someone had to create and assemble the parts. Parts cannot put themselves together. The idea that they can assemble themselves is the foolishness of evolution. And so if God was composed of parts, someone must have put this amazing being together. But God is not made he has no parts that make up God. He always was exactly who he is. Don't worry if you can't grasp this. The Bible says he is incomprehensible. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are his thoughts above our thoughts and his ways above our ways and his being and his nature above us. There never was a time when he was less than he is. Never was a time when he was an immature being. He was the same yesterday as he is today. And he will remain the same forever. What about the Trinity? Isn't God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Yes, he is. But the Godhead of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Bible declares, is one essence. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is God. As the Father, so the Son, so the Spirit, they are one. This is a great mystery that goes beyond our ability to comprehend. Although God is three, he is not a composite being. He is one. There is nothing else like him in existence. Nothing else that we can compare him to. So if no one made God, where did God come from? He had no origin, self-existent. Everything but God has 
an origin because everything but God once was not and then was created. And so this is why we have a hard time understanding God because everything else in existence once did not exist, but a creator made it. Where did you come from? Where did this world come from? Where did everything in this world and indeed in this universe come from? In John chapter 1 and verse 3, the Bible says, All things, all things were made and came into existence through him. And without him was not even one thing made that has come into being. Is there a God? <laughs> Look around you. Where did this all come from? There had to be a source, an origin. God is the source and the origin. You could deny the existence of God, but then how do you explain everything else? And that's the foolishness of evolution, trying to say that everything came from nothing. Um, Romans chapter 11, verse 36 for from him and through him and to him are all things. For all things originate with him and come from him and all things live through him and all things center in and tend to consummate and to end in him. God is the source and the cause of all things. He is the uncaused cause of all other things. Anything less than this in nature is simply less than God and not truly God at all. That's important for us to remember. To be, to be God, you have to have always been. No created being, including humans, angels, or demons, can ever one day become God. To be God, you must have always been God. Anything less is not and never can be God. So this is why, for example, it's unbiblical to say that Mary is the mother of God. How could Mary be the mother of God? She would have had to exist before God who had no beginning. God has no creator. He has no mother. He has no father. Now, Mary is the graciously chosen mother of the human body of Jesus, and she is nothing more. She was a mere fallen human being needing a savior just like the rest of humanity. And before Mary was, God was. And God created Mary. In the womb of the Virgin Mary, the great God Almighty took on the form of a baby, but he never changed from being fully God. Even though he became fully man, and this, again, is one of the mysteries. Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. God didn't change into something else. He continued to be fully what he always had been. But became fully man without his deity being altered or changed. Don't worry if you can't understand God. But let the incomprehensible nature and character of God give you confidence that he is beyond our abilities, incomprehensible. It's like uh, standing out on the tarmac in front of some amazing, fast, hypersonic jet with all the latest technology in it and with my non-techy brain trying to understand how does this thing work? How does it get off the ground? How does it do what it does? Um, you multiply that exponentially a billion times and you've got us sitting here today trying to comprehend God. How does that work? Um, he's amazing. He's absolutely amazing. That's why we worship him because we're little. And he is infinite. Not only is God's essence unchangeable, but everything about God is unchangeable. All his ways are unchangeable. 
Everything that God says will endure forever. God's word will never change. Matthew 24, verse 35, just one example of many we could give. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. God's word is just as true and relevant and effective today as it was on the day when he first spoke it. And our unchanging God will forever stand solidly behind his word. The message and the details of God's word will never need to be amended, updated, corrected, or changed. God is love, and his love will never change. His love for you will never change. In Jeremiah 31, verse 3, the Lord said to his people who had persistently rebelled against him, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. If his love is everlasting, he must be everlasting. And he loves you with an unchangeable love because he is unchangeable. We often hear people who were once lovers say to one another as they are breaking up, I just don't love you anymore. Brothers and sisters, that will never, ever happen with our God because our God's love for us is unchangeable. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And only an unchangeable being could make a declaration like that. It is this unchanging nature of God that gives me faith that he is still the God of miracles today. Today, there are many who believe and teach that there are no absolutes. They believe in relativism, especially when it comes to morality. They say there's no such thing as an absolute right or wrong that applies to everybody. Everything is relative. Relativism. Those who do not know God and believe in relativism say that what might be right for one person may be wrong for another. And what might be wrong for me to do might be perfectly okay for you to do. And therefore, they say, we cannot declare that any behavior is universally wrong for everyone. Now, if what is right and what is wrong is determined by people and their cultural preferences then morality will be relative because people and their cultures are always changing. So if they determine morality, if people determine what's right and wrong, it's always going to be changing. And it'll be different in different parts of the world. But what's right and what's wrong is not based upon man's ideas, nor is it dependent upon man's uh, views of things, the understanding of things. It's it's uh, not relative to human conviction or human circumstances. So in your circumstances, this is right, but you're in different circumstances. For, so that's right. Right and wrong are determined by God. And God never changes. And they are permanently established in God's written word, which is forever settled in heaven. Psalm 119 verse 89 tells us that. What was sin 2,000 years ago is still sin today. And what God declares to be sin in China is also sin in Africa. I'm, I'm talking about the biblical declarations of sin. I'm talking about the Ten Commandments, etc. That which is written in the Bible 
It is for all. Man has changed, and man is now comfortable with things like sex outside of a marriage covenant between one man and one woman. But God, who determined the best way for creation to function, has not changed. People have become corrupt, and they have changed, and now believe that medically assisted death is no longer murder. But God is immutable, and his word forever declares, you shall not murder. And surely, for your lifeblood, I will demand a reckoning, meaning I will require the blood of anyone who takes another person's life. Genesis 9.5. The Bible does not call all sex outside of marriage sin or taking another person's life sin because that was the view of people in a certain culture many years ago. But these things are wrong still today because they are a violation of our unchangeable God and his word and what he has established as the way his creatures should function within his creation in order to maximize their experience and to glorify the God who made them. The Bible is the unchangeable word of God, and it is the enduring standard by which all the world will one day be judged. There is coming a judgment day when the world will stand before a judge. They won't stand before a human court to give an answer for their lives, but the world will stand before the holy, immutable God who has made his will for all generations clear through his word. Perhaps you don't have a relationship with this unchanging God. And as you hear about a God who is the same, and he is perfect, and he is love, and his love for you will never change, and yet you long to be in that kind of a relationship. You long to be in relationship with someone who is committed, someone who is faithful, someone who is reliable, someone who will never fail you, who will never let you down. You were created for that. You were created for a permanent, unshakable relationship with God. And it is only when you are in that kind of relationship with him will you find the purpose and the fulfillment, the peace and the joy that you were meant to experience. Only when you put your faith in him can you enter into relationship with him, and you will find what your heart yearns for. The good news of the Bible is that you can find and enter into that secure and stable relationship that you long for. You can begin experiencing the security of his unchanging care for you, how? By putting your faith in him. By crying out to him. Well, where is he? How can I? He's everywhere. He's here. He hears you. Cry out to him. Invite him. Let him know that you want to enter into relationship with him. He will guide you. He will lead you. Ask others around you to explain this to you more, more fully. We would be glad to do that. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. He promises that he will lead you into a permanent relationship with him and one that will never fail, will never let you down. Heavenly Father, uh, thinking and pondering about such truths indeed makes us feel very small, very limited, limited in our understanding, limited in our ability to understand big truths. But Lord, I pray that you would increase our capacity, that you would increase our understanding of you, that you would increase our knowledge of you and our faith in you. And Lord, that you would increase our humility in reckoning that you and you alone are God. But oh, 
what amazing grace that you have lavished upon us that we should be called children of God. It's amazing, Lord. It's amazing. And I thank you that when these few years on this earth are done for those who are your children, life will have just begun when we pass from here into your presence, your visible presence. Lord, I thank you that that is possible. I pray for those who are not your children, that you would cause faith to rise up in their hearts, that you would stir in their hearts a longing and a yearning for you. Lord, for all of us, I pray that, that we would learn to relate to you rightly. And Lord, that we would be filled with proper awe and gratitude and thanksgiving for what you have done for us. And Lord, I pray that you would lead us into day by day a richer understanding of you, a richer experience of your grace, of your goodness, and of your love. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.